So let me start with uh, 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 trying to understand uh, what we are talking about. And let me fix uh, the elements to identify the perimeter of this, of this, uh, of this issue. Knowledge and, in and innovation. Quite a broad matter, quite, uh, you know, which has been uh, subject to a number of studies. If you look at uh, the bibliography, if you look at uh, the literature, which exists uh, is a kind of uh, infinite literature. Uh, everybody is talking about knowledge and innovation uh, from different uh, perspectives. You have the economist, uh, which insists uh, very much on uh, the importance of knowledge and innovation on uh, productivity, on uh, um, competitiveness, uh, on uh, growth uh, on uh, sustainable development, uh, on uh, job creation, etc., etc. So you have an economic uh, approach uh, to the team. Then uh, you have also the social approach, or sociological approach to the team. And uh, sociologists uh, in general focus very much on uh, governance issues. How um, knowledge and uh, technology and innovation have changed the world and uh, have changed the modus operandi of the most important actors being involved in this kind of uh, in this kind of matters, so there is a lot of focus on uh, 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 governance, possibly good governance, possibly effective governance, possibly uh, transparent uh, governance. But anyway, governance. Um, they also focus very much on uh, organizational change. Uh, 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 knowledge and innovation have an impact uh, at the macroeconomic level, but also they have an impact on uh, at the enterprise level, meaning at the microeconomic level. So companies, enterprises, etc., need to adapt to a change, and the sociologists focus very much on uh, typologies of uh, new typologies of business models, new typologies of organization, and an interaction between uh, old and new forces which are coming out of uh, innovation and technological change. Uh, of course, uh, you have also uh, social, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who are dealing with the social aspect of uh, science, uh, technology, and innovation. And in this case, uh, this kind of research is focusing on uh, possibilities for job creation, the possibility of uh, creating new skills capable to interact uh, more positively with machines and with automation. And also the uh, aspects referring to training and retraining. Because, of course, uh, when, you are, when you are in a situation of change, when you are in a situation of systemic and structural change, when you are in a situation of a transformational economy, of course, you need to have also human capital, which, is, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which needs to be adapted to the change and which needs to also to support the change. If you don't have a human capital, the right skills, the right uh, specializations, etc., etc., the innovation process uh, stops or is uh, delayed. So you have uh, this approach from a sociologist and also for, uh, from a social uh, scientist, if you like. And then you have uh, also uh, other kind of interventions, other kind of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, approaches which are very much uh, supported by political scientists and by those who are dealing with uh, security and by those uh, dealing with uh, uh, new risks and uh, new challenges. So you have also political scientists uh, who uh, uh, examine uh, issues referring to technological change and innovation from a security perspective, for instance. How these uh, mm, uh, the innovative, uh, innovative approaches, innovative uh, technologies may help fighting terrorism, may help uh, uh, increase in security, may help uh, uh, prevent conflicts, may help uh, to uh, uh, organize uh, better societies and uh, finalize uh, integration, uh, political integration, economic integration, or trade, in trade integration among the countries. So, uh, so you have also this kind of, uh, this kind of approach. Now, uh, from my, uh, on my side and uh, from my perspective, uh, of course, uh, I will examine also with you uh, um, uh, you know, what Europe is doing, uh, what Europe is doing in order to promote innovation, in order to diffuse innovation, in order to um, facilitate uh, uh, knowledge developments, and uh, what Europe is also um, doing in order to implement. So not only, uh, it's not only a matter of uh, facilitating, it's not only a matter of uh, promoting, but it's also a matter of doing what Europe is doing in order to uh, 
uh, make sure that uh, uh, the European uh, strategic objectives, which are Europe 2020, which are Europe 2030, which are Europe 2050, uh, these uh, strategic objectives are achieved. Um, uh, so this is uh, more or less uh, the structure of uh, uh, now of my of my presentation. Now, <coughs> before entering uh, the different subject, I would like to try to to provide you with some definitions because at the end of the day we needed to define this uh, this uh, this con concept and these notions. Uh, my definition is the following. Uh, I start with knowledge. Knowledge uh, is. Uh, uh, can be defined as a capacity to uh, acquire information, to build up this information, to expand this information. And uh, information coming from uh, uh, various uh, uh, horizons. You may have information coming from uh, the university. You may have information coming from uh, good reading. You have information coming from uh, your partners and coming from other quarters of the European society. Now. Um, uh, this uh, uh, information also may come from a practical experience. Uh, today, information is not only a matter of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, statements, or it's not only a matter of uh, um, uh, phrases, but it is very much related to data. Uh, we are entering a phase of uh, data. Uh, data, data, use of data, uh, data mining is uh, a key word in this, in this respect. So a lot of information is coming from uh, the uh, capacity that we have uh, to detect uh, the most important data, to select them, to elaborate them, and uh, to uh, make uh, full use of them. Um, uh, knowledge helps us to understand better ourselves, our motivations uh, as uh, consumers, our motivations as, uh, as uh, young people who have uh, professional perspectives. But it is also uh, a way to understand better the world which uh, surrounds us. Now, this world is uh, changing very fast. Globalization on one side, you may have the emergency of China on the other side, you have uh, uh, the impact of a financial crisis, you have uh, uh, the stabilization factors here and there, you have uh, uh, you know, uh, new uh, tendencies, uh, not only in the economics, but also in social matters, also in the political matters, in cultural matters, etc. So knowledge allows you, uh, if you increase your knowledge, if you uh, elaborate the data, if you understand the data, etc., you may also change your perceptions and uh, you also may be uh, more capable to, uh, to understand better these uh, changing um, uh, phenomena uh, under the, uh, which are witnessing uh, today. Now, knowledge has uh, some characteristics. Let me uh, in, in mention some of them. Uh, it's the world of idea. N an idea is an idea, cannot be consumed. <coughs> the idea is an immaterial element, uh, cannot be consumed. So the idea is, is uh, if it's expressed uh, and if it's dominant, is there, it remains there, and can be defeated by another idea which probably is considered better. But uh, the idea is different uh, from a consumable. So the idea is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is important uh, as, uh, as, uh, as a vector, as an uh, antecedent of this uh, uh, transformation that uh, I was uh, talking about. Uh, knowledge is a cumulative. Uh, you accumulate information. You add one information to another. So at the end of the day, you have uh, a basin of knowledge which may be more uh, useful. Uh, Knowledge is a repro re reproducible, can be uh, reproduced. Uh, you have uh, imitation effects. You may have uh, uh, you know, situations where uh, uh, you know uh, an idea is uh, reproduced, or uh, from an idea you have another idea. So you have a succession of ideas. And uh, as I said, the knowledge is a, a, a kind of a, a intangible asset. Uh, it will not die. It will. It will not. Uh, perish as uh, it happens to consumables, cannot be consumed, but uh, it can be uh, superseded by uh, other, uh, other uh, uh, ideological constructions or other ideas coming in. Of course, the uh, knowledge may apply to products, may apply to processes, and uh, may apply also to uh, people. Uh, products uh, may incorporate uh, new knowledge. Of course, uh, uh, an example is, uh, for instance, is uh, uh, 
the development of uh, knowledge database, uh, the, um, the, the, the development of uh, best practices based upon the knowledge. You have uh, uh, expert directories. You may have uh, uh, documenting uh, best practices. You have market intelligence. So all these activities which are uh, related to products uh, uh, can be implemented uh, provided that you have a good knowledge base. In terms of process, of course, uh, knowledge may apply to the different processes that we know. Um, is, uh, mm <coughs> and in terms of people, basically, uh, knowledge may, uh, may be important in terms of organization. Organization of life, organization of production, organization of an enterprise, organization of uh, an, an economy. And uh, uh, knowledge is also very important to facilitate, to support uh, uh, international uh, cooperation and to support also the creation of uh, new organizational uh, frameworks uh, such as uh, networks, uh, uh, consortia, etc., etc. So you share knowledge with other partners. And knowledge is also fundamental for international, international uh, relations, economic relations. Now, let me go to innovation. Uh, so on one side we have knowledge, then you have uh, an intermediate uh, phase which is uh, uh, the discovery, so from knowledge you have a discovery, something new, you discover something new, and from discovery you have innovation. What does it mean, innovation? Implementation of the discovery, operationalizing a discovery. You discover something and the I through the innovation process uh, you operationalize uh, this uh, discovery, so you make uh, products, you change a way of thinking, you change a way of uh, organizing yourself, you change it ways of organizing the production, etc., etc., or the economy. So you have these uh, three phases. As I said, knowledge, you, 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 you improve your knowledge, you have a discovery, you invent something new, discovery means you invent uh, something new, and then you have the implementation of this uh, discovery, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, the innovation, the innov innovative process. And uh, all these uh, three phases, are the key, the, the cornerstones of uh, what we call transformational society or transformational economy. So economy which is being transformed through knowledge and uh, through innovation. Now, innovation is, uh, <coughs> so is, a, is, a, is a, we, can, we can say that uh, um, the innovation uh, uh, can, be, can be seen from two angles. One is uh, innovation which applies uh, to products innovation which applies to uh, processes. Uh, 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 to product means that uh, you innovate the typology of product, you innovate the content of the project or the, or the product, you innovate uh, something, uh, you, you create something new uh, which uh, may be used also in the manufacturing industry or in the, sci uh, in the service industry uh, or, uh, uh, you know, some new services, uh, new, new uh, yeah, new uh, automation, uh, robotics, or things like that. And then also you have uh, uh, innovation which applies to, uh, to um, modus operandi, which applies to uh, processes. So it's a new way of organizing a factory, a new way of organizing um, uh, the econ you know, society, uh, you a new way of organizing, uh, you know, your, um, production and uh, um, new ways also to identify priorities, to identify objectives and also new ways of mobilizing resources. You may have innovation uh, referring to manufacturing industry, but you also you may have innovation referring to the banks. It's a fintech, it's just an example of this innovation. Uh, technology applied to, to, to finance. You may have innovation which applies to uh, consumer protection, innovations which apply to uh, uh, energy, the use of energy, or the uh, control of an environment, etc., etc. Now, um, <coughs> um, there are, of course, uh, um, different, uh, uh, I mean, as I said, there is a lot of literature uh, on innovation, uh, on science and technology and innovation. And uh, a lot of literature also describing this linkage between uh, um, knowledge uh, discoveries and innovation. Uh, mm -hmm. The most important uh, scientist who made a quite important contribution to this, uh, to this, uh, on, on this, to this team is uh, Schumpeter. Schumpeter is a distinguished economist, you may remember it. And he focuses very much on uh, um, 
the, um, um, the, 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 the subject was uh, how the technology uh, is changing. It's changing the production function, how technology and the technical progress uh, uh, may also contribute to the improvement of uh, uh, productivity and uh, the improvement of uh, uh, the uh, competitiveness either at uh, factory level but also at uh, country level. Then you have other contributors, who, uh, other uh, authors, who have uh, uh, fo focused very much on institutional factors, um, organizational factors, uh, how uh, technology and innovation have modified uh, the uh, production models and uh, the business models of uh, companies, but also of uh, um, you know, um, yeah, uh, economic, uh, economic actors other economic actors. And then, of course, you have uh, other uh, uh, scientists, uh, other researchers who have uh, uh, made the distinction between uh, uh, innovations which are, uh, uh, which are localized in a country, so local innovations, uh, uh, as compared to global innovations, uh, innovations which uh, may tend to alter the, gl the global uh, balance uh, uh, at, uh, at the world level. So this kind of, uh, there is this kind of a distinction. Uh, now, uh, I would like to, um, uh, to try to identify, uh, by using also an analysis uh, provided by uh, Professor Birmingham, who was uh, very busy on, uh, on a project uh, on knowledge and innovation financed by the European Commission. I would, to, I would like to try to identify um, uh, what, are the, 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 the what are the contents of, this in of, the, uh, of innovation, of an innovation process. Uh, the first point uh, that uh, this professor has mentioned uh, is uh, the importance of uh, the technology uh, 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 and the importance of technology in the, uh, as a, not only as a technical factor but also as an economic factor. Technology we may, uh, which may facilitate uh, or, uh, the, the mobilization of resources, technology which may, facilitate, which may contribute to a better positioning of uh, an enterprise or of a country in international scene, uh, and uh, uh, the importance of technology in explaining also uh, uh, organization, uh, organizational change. Um <coughs> then uh, uh, he, um, this professor has also mentioned that uh, uh, um, uh, innovation uh, imp implies a kind of uh, change of mentality. We are, from, uh, we are living a kind of static world and we enter a more dynamic world. And uh, so there is uh, an element of, uh, uh, of, of change and uh, an element of dynamism which is, uh, uh, which is uh, incorporated in an uh, economic system uh, given that uh, uh, the actors are very dynamic and they, um, uh, the, actors are very the economic actors are very interested to, uh, to, 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 to change ways of thinking and to, to introduce uh, uh, more uh, um, dynamic, uh, dynamic models. Uh, but I don't want to develop too much uh, these this points because uh, they belong more or less uh, to uh, economic theory or uh, to um, uh, uh, political economy, if you like, uh, discussions. Uh, and uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's just uh, sufficient to mention that uh, uh, these are more or less uh, the characteristics of, uh, of, of innovation. Uh, what is uh, probably more important uh, at uh, this stage uh, is uh, uh, to um, try to identify uh, the, the main principles of innovation. What are the, the values of innovation? What are the, the key elements uh, uh, referring to innovation which needs to be taken into consideration uh, to, uh, to understand uh, this uh, kind of transformational uh, uh, phenomenon? Uh, the, first, uh, the first principle, the first value that I would like to, to show, uh, I would like to say, refers to the um, ethical and moral values. Uh, innovation may lead to uh, complicated uh, situations. Uh, mm, 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 think in terms of, uh, for instance, uh, bioethics, uh, things about uh, medicine, uh, things about uh, uh, research in medicine or innovation in medicine. Um, and uh, you immediately understand what are the, uh, the moral and uh, uh, you know, ethical and moral uh, um, elements that uh, uh, needs to be taken into account. That uh, I mean, questions. Uh, many many cases you have uh, issues. In many questions, in many cases you have uh, you have uh, you have uh, disputes also eh? because uh, uh, ethical and moral values uh, change uh, not only 
during the over time, but they change also country by country or continent by continent. So, but this is the problem. Um, innovation may raise uh, this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of problems. Then uh, there is uh, another uh, principle, very important for innovation, is that uh, the principle is that uh, uh, we, we need to share uh, results of innovation. Innovation cannot be isolated uh, from uh, the rest of society. Uh, innovation is not a private property. Innovation, uh, in to some extent, uh, is also um, a kind of uh, human, uh, human rights. Um, people need to have uh, free access uh, to innovation. Think about uh, uh, new generic medicine, for instance. Think about uh, 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 having access uh, to basic uh, innovations in the field of energy, in the field of water, in the field of, uh, uh, um, you know, in the field of management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So innovation needs to be, uh, let's say, distributed and needs to be accessible, uh, free of charge uh, to uh, the large, uh, large size of uh, of, uh, of uh, human population. Uh, and this raised the issue of uh, the patent, uh, patent, uh, patent uh, uh, and the patent protection, which is uh, very often requested by the medical industry, uh, the industry of producing medicines, in order to protect the innovation for a certain number of years. Okay, this is fine, but uh, there is immediately the problem of how to ensure uh, a, fairly, uh, a fairly good access of people to these uh, innovative, uh, to innovative uh, products. Then there is a principle of solidarity. Uh, if you have a, a case of crisis, if you have a case of uh, distress, if you also in the f uh, if if a country or if a people or if an enterprise uh, is uh, suffering for a certain number of uh, reasons, uh, innovation, uh, sharing innovation, and uh, distributing innovation and making innovation accessible may be uh, a solution. So in this case, uh, the principle of solidarity can apply. Um, there is uh, also um, uh, another principle which is very important, is that innovation uh, cannot, uh, cannot uh, uh, let's say, um, be uh, introduced uh, only by uh, uh, private forces, by private actors, but uh, of course you need uh, a support, you need an incentive from a public, uh, public authorities. So innovation policies uh, quite often are implemented by public authorities by the state. So we need to recognize the importance of the state in the field of uh, uh, technological progress and in the field of, uh, of, uh, uh, in, in the field of, uh, of, of innovation. Uh, despite the fact that uh, we are market oriented and despite the fact that we recognize the importance of the private investment, but anyway, in many cases innovation can be achieved only if there is, uh, only if there is a public, uh, public support. And this is uh, another principle, which is, uh, uh, so um, in this respect, uh, I have to say that uh, um, uh, it's very important to generate uh, situations where you have a cooperation between the state or public authorities on one side and also private investors. So uh, in this respect, uh, innovation uh, and the technological change is very much uh, promoted by uh, initiatives which are jointly promoted by private and public. So it's a typical area where you have uh, PPPs, if you are aware, uh, aware of this uh, terminology, which is uh, public and private uh, partnerships, PPPs. Typical example. And uh, uh, private consortia and platforms quite often uh, enjoy or they, uh, they contribute to achieve uh, these, uh, these uh, PPP uh, initiatives with, uh, with the public authorities. Uh, we need also, this is another important principle, we need uh, to avoid the negative use of uh, innovation, negative use of, uh, uh, you know, uh, negative use of innovations. Uh, you may wish to remember the debate around the use of atomic bomb in 44-45. The idea was uh, to harness uh, the atomic power. There was a Manhattan project and then uh, the, this uh, Manhattan project uh, led to the atomic bombardment of Japan. So, and uh, you remember the dispute between uh, those who worked through this, uh, through this program, Einstein, Oppenheimer, etc., etc. And uh, so this is an example. But uh, there are also other examples of innovations which at the end of the day uh, are uh, uh, more negative than positive. Uh, so we need, to we need to identify, uh, to understand what is negative, what is positive, which is not easy. And secondly, we need to avoid to use, uh, the, to use uh, the, the, this innovation in a, in a, negative, uh, in a negative way. 
Um, and innovation is also a mindset. Is innovation is not only uh, something which is uh, new, uh, it's not only something which uh, uh, is discovered or is implemented or is, uh, yeah, is applied to our life, uh, but it's also a mindset. You may have uh, uh, innovative communities. You may have in a country, uh, you have uh, three quarters of the population is lazy, is not willing to progress. They are very reluctant to take risks, etc. due to a number of uh, different uh, uh, let's say background elements, uh, culture, religion, whatever, but you may have uh, niches of uh, people uh, who are innovative, uh, who are uh, pushing for, who are uh, risk takers, and uh, uh, so is a, is a mindset. And uh, at the European level, particularly European level, we needed to introduce this uh, um, new mindset, uh, particularly among the young generations. Uh, we should not forget at the European level, uh, for a number of years, we have uh, had a very important uh, role of the state in the economy. Many countries, uh, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, were socialist, uh, were under command economy, uh, where the state was uh, supposed to organize everything, but also in the Scandinavian world. You remember that uh, in, the, in the past, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the public authorities were taking care uh, from, uh, of, of, of a person from the, from the cradle to the to the to the to the end of their life, uh, so there were uh, this kind of uh, socialist uh, or anyway, uh, yeah, um, ways of of thinking and way of ways of doing, and all that uh, probably has contributed to a kind of uh, um, reluctance to to take uh, to take uh, I mean private initiatives and to take uh, innovative uh, private initiatives. Today the situation is a bit different because uh, we are. Uh, uh, we are in a globalized uh, system and uh, therefore we need to compete uh, uh, on a free market basis uh, principles. Uh, we have to compete with uh, very dynamic emerging economies uh, um, uh, uh, and very innovative uh, emerging economies including India, China, uh, but also the US. And now, um, uh, one word about uh, the actors. Who are the actors of uh, uh, this innovation process and this uh, uh, technological change process. Uh, actors are not only individuals, they are entrepreneurs, it's fine. Everybody knows that. Actors may also be bankers. The bankers are supposed to, to finance innovative initiatives. Uh, by the way, I don't know how to and to what extent the current uh, banking management in Europe is capable to uh, take new risks or is uh, willing also to take new risks. Some of them are very conservative, uh, but anyway. We needed to, to make sure that uh, resources are channeled towards these uh, uh, innovative and risky objectives. Anyway, bankers are uh, important actors. Then you have, uh, um, let's say, invisible actors, if you like. Uh, I, remi I, remi I remember this invisible hand uh, of a Schumpeterian uh, uh, um, reference. Uh, Schumpeter was talking about the market as, as invisible hand. Now, in this case, uh, I'm not talking about the market, but I'm talking about, uh, for instance, networks. Uh, networks, uh, platforms. These are new actors of, uh, in the innovation uh, process. Uh, grouping of people. Uh, some of them uh, are not even uh, in the same uh, city or in the same country. Uh, you have uh, global uh, networks. So you may have uh, forces which uh, express uh, viewpoints, which express orientations, but uh, they are not uh, immediately visible. They are not immediately uh, per 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 perceived as... Uh, as, uh, as uh, um. So you have uh, this kind of uh, new actors. Then you have, of course, uh, the asset managers. You have uh, those who, in a different cities or in a different context, uh, are uh, uh, you know, creating these uh, new innovative uh, funds for uh, channeling investment uh, uh, from uh, uh, from savings to to to, to investment uh, in uh, in innovative uh, innovative uh, uh, innovative um, uh, uh, activities. Uh, you have uh, uh, also new factors. What are the new factors uh, pushing for innovation, pushing for uh, um, uh, you know transformational economy? Uh, these new factors are uh, quite important. I wanted to mention three or four. One is, uh, as I said, the role of the state uh, and the role of the public power the role of the public authorities uh, to facilitate, to uh, mobilize resources, to facilitate investment, to provide the general orientations. Here I'm not referring to the five-year uh, development plan uh, which was uh, used uh, in the Soviet Union or used uh, still today, used in China, etc. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about uh, actions that the state, 
that public authorities may put in place in order to, um, to support the innovation. So the, the role of the state is very important. Then uh, you have uh, skills. Uh, innovation uh, and the technological transformation cannot be supported if you don't have the exact skills, uh, the correct uh, skills. Uh, skills are not only, uh, you know, uh, the skills uh, which uh, are formed, uh, which are uh, the results of university studies. You may have other type of skills coming from uh, different uh, learning centers. You may have skills coming from experience. You may have skills coming from uh, even, uh, uh, you know, very basic uh, uh, technical education, but the skills anyway are important. We should not forget that many of the innovations uh, coming out of from, from Silicon Valley were uh, first of all adopted in a garage. So we had young people who put together some small resources in a garage and then eventually they developed uh, their own uh, their own business, multi-billion business. So but I mean skills are important, at least uh, also this, the mindset is important. I wanted to take a risk. I would like to, uh, to show that uh, I am uh, uh, I'm, uh, quite uh, effective in my initiatives. I want to show that, uh, um, mm, that uh, I can uh, make a progress uh, uh, for myself, for my family and for, for, the, for the collectivity. So this kind of uh, um, determination and this kind of technical skills are, are very important. Then uh, what is also an important determinant for uh, um, in, in, in innovation and uh, industrial innovation, in innovation in general sense, is uh, the availability of financial resources. So uh, founders, uh, uh, I mean uh, bankers, once again, uh, investors, need to be uh, available in order to support uh, the, um, the, um, the innovation process in a, in a given country. And then, of course, you have universities. Uh, so we needed to make sure that people go to STEM uh, people go to science and technology uh, enterprise and mathematics in the universities. Uh, this is very important to create incentives for, for this kind of studies because at the end of the day, uh, once again, knowledge needs to be put together with, uh, needs to lead to uh, innovation, to discoveries and innovation. So education in the field of STEM is, ve is very important. Now let me talk about the uh, the recent evolution of the European uh, European industry uh, and uh, uh, how um, uh, what are the the, 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 the let's say the um, uh, innovative elements of uh, of, uh, of the European economy and uh, where, where where we stand with uh, in innovation in Europe. Um, now, first of all, let me make uh, just a kind of uh, a kind of uh, historical uh, resume, if you like. Um, today we are talking about Industry 4.0. This is the key word. Industry 4.0 means uh, automation, means robotics, uh, means uh, uh, not, mm, another way of, uh, of thinking production, manufacturing production, etc., etc. But why we are talking about Industry 4.0? Because we have uh, had Industry 1.0, Industry 2.0, and Industry 3.0. Let me see there's uh, three phases. Industry 1.0 is uh, uh, related to the first industrial revolution, which took place in the UK, essentially in uh, Great Britain, from uh, 1760s to uh, 1830, uh, uh, 1840, if you like, and based essentially on uh, three things, uh, use of steam, use of water through the canals, and uh, uh, creation of a uh, financial system, which was a supportive financial system. New banks, uh, new operators, uh, new, uh, new, uh, new, new agent, new economic agents, if you like. And uh, this uh, first phase of uh, uh, industrial revolution was not uh, necessarily supported by university-based uh, skills. Skills were very practical. S uh, people, in, mm, mecha mm, mechanicians, or people having very basic and, prag and practical skills, they invented uh, new things, new, new operations, new machines. Uh, they were not necessarily people graduating from Oxford or Cambridge. They were uh, people who were uh, engaged, uh, even at the family level, for generations in practical activities. So they implemented, they invented something new uh, following on the basis of their own uh, basic uh, skills, not necessarily related uh, with the university um, uh, or uh, degrees or whatever. Then uh, we have the second, uh, the second uh, uh, phase, which is uh, uh, more or less uh, 1860 to uh, 
the beginning of the First World War, uh, even during the First World War. Um, and uh, this was uh, basically um, an industrial revolution which took place uh, in the US uh, after the Civil War and uh, in, uh, in Germany, uh, and in Germany basically, and also to some extent in France. And it was based essentially on uh, the introduction of telephone, the introduction of electricity, the introduction of telegraph, and uh, a beginning of an, an extensive, uh, progressive, uh, progressively more and more uh, use of chemicals, uh, chemistry. So chemistry was also uh, chemical discoveries. Uh, discoveries in the chemicals, in chemical field, were also one of the uh, one of the uh, driving forces of this uh, second revolution. And as I said, at the core of this uh, second revolution, we have uh, two big countries. One uh, was the U.S. and the second one was uh, um, Germany. This uh, second revolution was very much uh, uh, based on university studies. So technical universities in Germany supported very much innovation during at that time. Uh, big uh, discoveries in the U.S. and big uh, innovation in the U.S. were also suppo suppo supported by uh, uh, by uh, East Coast uh, uh, universities in, in the U.S. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, so you had uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of nexus between uh, knowledge on one side and uh, innovation on the other side. Then we had uh, the third uh, phase, and this is why we are talking about Industry 3.0, uh, and we reach now uh, Industry 4.0, but mm, Industry 3.0, this is uh, the, the time of, uh, uh, you know, the kind of innovation and innovative, uh, no, innovation revolution soon after the, uh, the Second World War. Uh, I, for I, I, I leave uh, aside for, for a while the Depression period, so the, the 10 or 15 years of a big depression in Europe. And let me, uh, re let me reach uh, the, the period of after the Second World War. So the, uh, bay, the big innovations uh, took place uh, after the Second World War. And these innovations, so there's a technological change, was very much uh, motivated by the need for reconstruction in Europe uh, and also by the progressive transformation of uh, old, um, uh, old uh, industries in Europe towards a more uh, technically oriented and technologically oriented uh, industries in Europe. We should not forget that uh, this kind of transforma transformation led to a big uh, crisis uh, and the restructuring needs of uh, traditional industries uh, such as the glass industry, steel industry, shipbuilding industry, and uh, also uh, telecom telecommunication industry. So, and we arrived to uh, early 80s. To the early 80s, uh, um, we start with the Industry 4.0 uh, period, which uh, was very much determined at, at least in Europe, uh, determined uh, by the fact that we needed to compete with Japan. Uh, Japanese uh, was uh, the driving force at the time, leading uh, the first, uh, first stage of globalization, if I may say so. And uh, they started inundating the market with their own uh, very cheap uh, products, including also uh, cars, car, cars and uh, mm, electronics, uh, consumable electronics, etc., etc. So this was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Europeans were obliged to react uh, to that, and uh, therefore they underwent uh, a major industrial transformation in order to make sure that they, their economy should continue to be competitive, particularly against, as I said, the Japan and also the, the famous Asian Tigers. You remember this terminology. During the 80s, we were talking about Asian Tigers, which was Japan, Korea, Singapore, and probably also Malaysia or maybe Indonesia. Um, and then uh, we arrive to uh, our time, and uh, our time is uh, start with uh, uh, you know a beginning of 2000. At the beginning of the year 2000, with uh, the in Europe we have the finalization of European single market. You had uh, the introduction of the euro, and you had also the the, uh, the I mean uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, revitalization of, uh, of, uh, of economies which were rather sleepy including, for instance, uh, the German economy soon after the uh, enlargement of Germany. And also, um, of course, uh, Europe was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, mm, uh, was uh, uh, very much uh, uh, involved in the, in the, in the um, uh, um, enlargement process and also in the, um, 
uh, in the transformation of their own uh, of, 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 of its own its own uh, um, industrial sectors. Uh, because at that time, uh, it was uh, particularly during the first uh, first ten years of uh, two the year 2000, let's say to the financial crisis, uh, Europe understood quite well that uh, um, there was uh, an emerging economy in Asia, China, uh, that uh, would uh, become uh, quite important uh, horsepower uh, in, uh, in, in, in the global economy uh, soon, after, soon after its, uh, its accession to... Uh, to um, uh, world Trade uh, WTO World Trade Organization. So we are uh, <coughs> we arrived to uh, we arrived to the financial crisis, and uh, the financial crisis 2010 uh, 2016 17 uh, yeah 15 16 17 so about eight eight years. This financial crisis hit the European economy quite uh, quite uh, quite uh, quite a lot. Uh, there has been. Uh, uh, many SMEs uh, were not capable to compete. Uh, many SMEs uh, were cut off from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, yeah, one minute, one more minute. Oh yeah, 15 oh, 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so one minute is, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, uh, you know, there was uh, there was uh, uh, another process of, uh, uh, another process of, uh, 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 let's say, as uh, to use always uh, the Schumpeter phrase of creative destruction. Um, many companies uh, went bankrupt, many companies uh, and many small companies essentially were not capable to resist uh, the international comp com competition uh, in, a, in a world which uh, was becoming more and more globalized uh, in terms of technology, in terms of finance, in terms of uh, uh, global supply chains, etc. Et the European MEs uh, were more uh, stru restru structured, uh, were more solid, and uh, uh, many of them uh, decided to go global once again, they, so they took the risk. And uh, they um, and uh, they became global, and therefore they were more able to to resist uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, let's say uh, this kind of negative uh, conjuncture. Now, at the European level, what uh, what uh, what was done at European level? Um, uh, of course, uh, Europe has to take into consideration that uh, uh, industrial pol industrial policies have never been uh, uh, a subject of. Uh, of uh, of uh, European integration process, uh, what Europe uh, did uh, till uh, till uh, very few years ago was ju just to provide recommendations and to provide the directives and to provide orientations. You may remember the Davignon plan on uh, plan on uh, industries like uh, steel industry or uh, shipbuilding industries during the 70s, but uh, Europe has always uh, avoided uh, to interfere too much, uh, also because the, pre the prevalent uh, let's say ideological. Um, uh, the prevalent ideological uh, vision was uh, to leave the market uh, to play the game. Uh, market, uh, I mean, a free market. It was a kind of liberalism, and therefore the role of the state in the economy declined dramatically, and uh, many uh, activities were left to the market uh, on the assumption that the market uh, may correct gaps or uh, imbalances. But this is was not necessarily what happened, but anyway. At a certain point, Europe uh, decided, I mean, discovered uh, the importance of the manufacturing industry. Till 2010-2012, uh, 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 European economy evolved in a way that uh, the uh, manufacturing, the industrial component of GDP declined dramatically. It was 20-25, uh, uh, during the 70s, uh, it declined to 13-14 percent of GDP. Whereas uh, a lot of uh, activities were based, and a lot of GDP was based on, uh, on financial activities. So finance uh, was a kind of uh, the queen of the, of the game, and uh, was also the sector that was providing uh, incredible margins uh, to, the, to the actors. So, but at a certain point, uh, uh, it was also necessary to address the problem of unemployment, and therefore, uh, uh, and also the, uh, the industrial competitiveness and uh, the future of the European industry. What to do with uh, the uh, European industry as compared to the Chinese industry? What to do with European industry as compared to the American industry, etc., etc. So, the, uh, and Europe discovered uh, at around 2010-2012, uh, discovered that uh, uh, the European economy de facto deindustrialized. Uh, as I said, the component, the industrial component of the GDP declined dramatically and creating a lot of uh, job uh, problems and creating also a lot of uh, training, the need for training and retraining because 
On one side, the financial services and the services in general increased, and on the other side, also uh, uh, robotization and automation was proceeding, was progressing, and therefore you need also different kind of uh, uh, skills and different kind of uh, professional, uh, professional, uh, um, uh, professional skills, professional uh, specializations. And therefore, uh, uh, at around 2012, 2013, uh, you had the communications, the most important communication, the most important uh, uh, a new elaboration at the European level. And uh, this uh, um, uh, elaboration was based upon the concept of uh, uh, European uh, uh, renaissance in the field of industry, European industrial renaissance, uh, European uh, uh, renaissance in the field of manufacturing. The idea was uh, to uh, make sure that the manufacturing sector uh, should uh, uh, its contribution to the formation of GDP should increase uh, from uh, 12 to 13 percent to 20 percent by 2020. In addition, Europe also had uh, this kind of a very ambitious target, which was, uh, uh, you remember the phrase of President Prodi in the year 2000, saying that uh, Europe should uh, become the most important uh, technological uh, count continent, uh, the most important continent, uh, and uh, um, in the field of technology, in the field of innovation, uh, overcoming all the other countries and all, all the other uh, continents uh, by the year 2020. Uh, and uh, the strategy, the European, uh, the Europe 2020 strategy was uh, based essentially on this, uh, on this assumption. So on one side, uh, there was the idea to uh, revitalize European industry, but on the other side, uh, there was also the idea of uh, recreating a very competitive a very productive European industry, based very much on the use of uh, computers, based very much on the use of ITC instruments. And uh, this is why we are talking about Industry 4.0. Now, Industry 4.0 essentially is based upon the notion that uh, uh, processes need to be automatized, uh, extensive use of robots, a way, different way of organizing uh, production, a create, creating a an intimate relationship between uh, uh, manufacturing and services, reforming <coughs> the overall uh, banking system in order to support uh, this uh, reorganizational and also this uh, strategic, uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, orientation. Uh, and uh, uh, um, the idea was also to, uh, to try to support uh, this uh, myriad, this uh, wide variety of uh, European SMEs uh, uh, which were uh, uh, incapable either to make investments in the field of innovation and secondly, incapable to compete with other uh, uh, companies, other enterprises around the world, particularly those uh, coming from, uh, from China. Many of them, uh, by the way, supported by the government, or many of them state-owned. So uh, this is also an, a distorting element in the global uh, uh, competition. So this was, uh, the strategy was, uh, was based upon innovation, the strategy was based upon, a uh, European strategy was based upon innovation. European strategy was also uh, very much uh, uh, supported by instruments, financial instruments. One of them is Horizon 2020. Another instrument uh, was uh, uh, COSME in favor of SMEs. A third instrument was uh, uh, the financial instruments stemming from uh, the commitments taken at the COP21 on, on conference on climate change. Other instruments also were uh, bilateral instruments. So European instruments were uh, used in a very, uh, by creating synergies with uh, bilateral instruments mobilized by German government, by the French government, by the Italian government, by the Spanish government, etc., etc. And uh, the idea was also to create, uh, uh, to facilitate the creation of consortia, the cre cre create of, uh, to, to create uh, also um, uh, new stru structures uh, such as uh, platforms, such as, uh, uh, you know, flagship initiatives, pilot initiatives, etc., etc. Uh, all together, um, together with the member states. Uh, the idea for the European Commission was to work with, uh, very closely with the member states and also to broaden this cooperation to include also other partners around the world. This is why the program Horizon 2020 program was open to all the countries in the world. This is why Ram Erasmus has become Erasmus Mundus. This is why uh, many other uh, uh, programs uh, of exchanges of professors, uh, teachers, uh, universities have also been uh, extended to uh, non-European uh, member states. 
But uh, the idea was uh, to, you know, to create uh, conditions uh, for uh, uh, making sure that uh, Europe may become more, uh, may become more prosperous in terms of GDP growth, may become more inclusive in terms of uh, uh, job creation and in terms of uh, wages and salaries, and may become more sustainable in uh, medium and long term in terms of uh, uh, environmental protection and climate change. Uh, and of course, uh, Europe, uh, um, uh, by using its instruments, together with uh, the instruments of member states, developed uh, uh, very important programs. And here in my note, uh, I don't want it to be too much uh, detailed on that, but in my note uh, I mentioned some of these programs which were financed, which are still being financed by the European, uh, European instruments. One of these projects is called the Smart Cities, to make uh, cities more uh, livable, more uh, better organized, better transport, better, uh, you know, less polluting uh, activities, etc., etc. Uh, more, uh, um, so this is a program, Smart Cities. Another program is uh, Internet of Things, meaning interconnection between humans and machines. Um, another program, uh, uh, important program, was uh, uh, the um, uh, Smart Textile. Uh, which means that uh, textile material may also um, be uh, become more, uh, I mean, smarter in terms of, uh, yeah, five minutes, in terms of uh, uh, interconnection with uh, humans. And also another program, uh, quite important program was, uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, um, a circular economy, certainly, uh, meaning uh, the transformation of uh, of waste um, and uh, ICT as a, as a way to um, uh, SAT, um, ICT as a way to to improve uh, com competitiveness and uh, to improve uh, also uh, productivity. ICT means also um, construction of uh, uh, ultra fast computers, uh, calculations, uh, data. Uh, so the elaboration of data in real time. Uh, so ICT uh, means uh, a number of things. Uh, which uh, I try to describe in this uh, in this paper, and then of course uh, there was also an important component in all that is a space policy, and uh, more recently a defense policy. Uh, when I say defense policy, I say research in the in, in the field of defense. Research. Um, what are the perspectives now? Where we are? Um, globalization will continue. Uh, despite uh, um, attempts to uh, limit it or uh, mm, ways of uh, interpreting it in a different way. Um, but uh, globalization will continue. Um, the uh, competitiveness from emerging economies uh, will continue, um, particularly from, from China. Um, we have a number of anti-dumping uh, cases with China, but uh, certainly China, um, through its overproduction, will continue to invade the European markets with uh, their own products, so we are in this uh, scenario. A newcomer is India. Um, newcomer not only in Europe but also in other parts of uh, in other parts of uh, of the world. And uh, India is uh, producing incredible number of uh, uh, scientists and computer and computer literate people. And as a computer literate people are uh, quite uh, um, important for uh, a number of countries, which uh, tend to uh, attire them. Uh, Indians in Silicon Valley, Indians in Germany. So you have uh, a lot of uh, uh, high-tech migration from India, uh, particularly in the field of uh, uh, computer, uh, computer science. And then, uh, of course, uh, you, have, uh, um, you have the problems of Europe, uh, which uh, some of them are uh, related to automation, some of them are related to the use of uh, robotics, but uh, some, of, some of these problems have nothing to do with uh, with uh, technological change or with the technology. We have uh, structural problems uh, in terms of uh, East and West divide. We have structural problems in terms of uh, uh, economy versus uh, social objectives. Uh, there is a major problem uh, uh, at the European level uh, referring to coherence. Uh, do we want growth? Do we want inclusiveness? Do we want uh, specialization? Do we want uh, to compete in European market or the international market? So we do not know. Uh, essentially what, uh, what, we, what we are doing and what we want uh, at this stage. Uh, we need to see uh, now the next, uh, the next uh, 10 years uh, with uh, the new Commission and uh, the new European Parliament. We have uh, a new instrument, uh, the, uh, I mean uh, uh, a good instrument which is uh, the, financial, uh, the, the, the new financial perspectives of the European Union. 
uh, for 21, 27. Uh, we are talking about uh, using, uh, mobilizing 1% of European GDP, which is uh, more or less a one, 1 trillion during these uh, seven years, 1 trillion euro. And uh, the idea is uh, to see now, the problem is to see now how and to what extent uh, this European budget uh, will support, uh, will continue to support innovation, uh, science and technology, research, innovation and uh, skills. So there's, uh, there's uh, as, you, as you can see, the, all these components are quite crucial. And all these components will be uh, essential in order to ensure that uh, Europe uh, uh, continues to be an effective and important uh, economic actor at the world, world level. Okay, thank you for your attention. I hope to have respected more or less uh, the time. Thank you for your uh, signal. Okay, so before starting the discussion with Professor Mogni, we will do a quick 15 minute presentation on this presentation. Um, so just the outline of what we'll say. First, we'll sh show some stylized facts about the impact of the crisis on the European industry, in particular on small and medium enterprises. Then we look at the, what has been the response of the European Union to this issue. Uh, and in the third part, we look at what are the major challenges that are sti still to be solved for the European Union. And finally, we will start the discussion with s a few questions that we that we'll ask. So the first is stylized fact. I'm sorry, it's a bit hard to read the axis, but it's uh, manufacturing production across the all the 28 European countries from 2000 to 2013. And we can see that obviously here it's 2008-2009, the crisis had a major impact on manufacturing across all European countries. Uh, looking a bit more in details, we can see here that uh, small and medium enterprises has been uh, affected more hardly by the crisis than bigger com companies. In particular, large enterprises in 2014, they already recover, fully recovered from the crisis and their value added was already higher than their level in 2008, whereas it was not yet the case for small enterprises. Um, and going more detail among uh, small and medium enterprises, we can see that uh, here we have the change in value added between 2008 and 2015 uh, across companies uh, that are separated between low-tech and high-tech firms with two intermediate categories that are in between. Uh, and we can see that um, high technology, uh, small and medium enterprises have been less, have lost less value added during the period than the low technological one, which shows that the most innovative firms, which are um, generally more related with high technology, mm -hmm. has been uh, has resisted, has been more resilient during the crisis. And so, based on this observation, what we can we can think, what we can see is that first we, uh, we, we need a European policy to help firms to recover from the crisis. And that in particular we have to focus on small and medium enterprises and because the more innovative uh, small companies resisted better to the crisis, we should focus on helping firms to innovate and becoming more innovative and that it should be help them to, to recover it should help small com firms to recover f uh, better from the crisis. And this is, this is based on this kind of idea that um, the, European, the European Union started to react to the crisis and implemented a lot of policies. Um, so for, um, I will go quickly because Professor Mogni gave a lot of details about it. But uh, European Union's objectives are quite ambitious. In particular, they, they want to increase the share of manufacturing in U European GDP from 14% to 20%. Um, and to summarize quickly the, the method that they are using for this, they are trying, for, for instance, to help uh, small and medium enterprises to access, uh, to access to funds more easily, and in particular to access to equity funds. Uh, there are a lot of training and retraining programs for workers in order to provide uh, to innova innovative firms more more skilled workers that they need to, be, to innovate. There are also direct support of some innovative projects, uh, for instance, smart and green cities and a few other ones. Uh, a lot of work about harmonization of the European regulatory framework uh, and a lot of support in terms of helping firms to research, to form cluster of companies that can work together, to collaborate with, uh, also to, col to collab increase collaboration between firms and um, universities. 
and also a lot of work on helping firms to integrate into global value chains so that they can access to new markets. Um, however, as a post-Keynesian economist, my, my, I find all these policies, I, th I think that all these policies are quite nice and should be very helpful for firms, but they are mostly supply, uh, they, are foc they focus mainly on the supply side of production and there is not, uh, at the European level, in a, there is almost nothing about helping firms on the demand side. Whereas when we look at what, is the, what are the kind of issues that firms are facing, here we have the result of a survey uh, where firms were asked what is the most pro prob pressing problem they are facing. The first result to the survey among small and medium enterprises has been that they have difficulty to find customers, which, say differently, means that they have a problem of aggregate demand. Okay. I, yes, I will continue with some uh, major challenges that this uh, industrial transformation uh, posed for the, the European self uh, from an internal perspective. And we found two major observations. Uh, that's that the transition is uh, leading to uh, inequalities and concentration. Uh, inequalities because uh, we have a talent bias technical change, as uh, Professor Mongni mentioned before. So uh, less skilled workers are uh, losing participation on this process, and that's something important. I will show you some graphs uh, in the next slide. And second, uh, we have a, uh, an issue on appropriability uh, that leads to concentration because two aspects, mainly uh, because of the nature of knowledge uh, goods with the high uh, uh, intellectual pro property protection uh, implies low marginal cost and cumulativeness uh, and guarantees monopolistic position. This, uh, in the long term, will concentrate a lot of resources in a few uh, firms. And this happens in different levels be between countries, within countries, and within regions and cities. Uh, about the first uh, observation, we can see how evolved the participation of uh, more skilled workers in relation to less skilled workers. And this is really important also in the long term if we consider the opportunities of the children and the future generations of these people that are being excluded. Because they, are, they, are not, they cannot be also part of the training programs because they are not trained enough to be part of the training programs. So they, ha they are being excluded. And this has a long term influence in their children that are, they are affected in their education capacities uh, for future because of the background uh, social, uh, the social background that they have, so they, the families influence uh, their possibility to reach uh, the skill level that is much more important these days for production. So that's very important for us. And second, uh, we have the concentration effect here. Uh, it's just an example because we know that innovation is something. It's a very complex process, and it's not only based on. Uh, knowledge, but uh, this graph can be also uh, represented uh, as infrastructure or opportunities to finance. And we can see that it's mainly concentrated in the north and also within countries. The amount of patents that it's the knowledge, it's concentrated in specific regions within countries. Italy and France are interesting, like Italy, we can see everything in the north, and in France mostly it's in Paris. Uh, so that's also a main issue that how to distribute and how to promote uh, the growth in other regions that are not being affected by this new industrial revolution. So based on these uh, complementary poli uh, based on these observations that we found, we think that complementary policies, uh, uh, maybe more integra integra uh, vertical integration, or as and Stan mentioned before, uh, demand directed. Uh, we believe that in this sense, education is very important and maybe uh, inclusive innovation, smart specialization strategies. I don't have enough time to develop these uh, strategies, but we think that they could be interesting. Uh, and now I will leave the place to Philip. He will present some issues about uh, the financial part, uh, how to finance these projects. Yes. So. Uh, before doing that, um, I would like to bring uh, the attention back to uh, the Lisbon objective, with, uh, which you already referred to. Um, uh, so the Lisbon agenda was uh, yeah, devised in the year 2000, and um, as, you already, as you already said, it was 
um, as, yeah, the, the, the goal was to make Europe by 2010, in mm, fact, 10, yeah. um, the most competitive and the most dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world. And so this is already a big shift, in fact, um, uh, um, by, by thinking that investment in knowledge and not in, uh, um, let's say, primarily productive assets uh, will bring the development we wish for. So that has to be recognized in the, in the first step, I think, I think, which is very good. And then, um, yeah, and then we, uh, uh, yeah, this agenda has by 2010 largely failed, which is widely recognized and uh, translated then into the Horizon 2020 agenda. Um, uh, which you also already alluded to. Um, uh, and the Horizon 2020 is the framework program number eight in the European Union. And uh, yeah, so this is how, how, um, uh, how uh, uh, yeah, the, um, uh, the, 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 the expenditure in, in research, um, uh, in joint research activities is being financed at the European level since the European Single Act in 1987, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so there has been some progress, but uh, the EU is still lagging, lagging behind in, in important aspects, and we're going to turn to one of them now. Just here again, the Horizon 2020 is the framework program eight. It's around ab about the, the whole we just discussed that, um, yeah, 70, 71 to 80 billion, it depends on which price you take. Um, and Horizon Europe, which is its a successor starting in 2020, um, is supposed to be an even, an even more extensive and more ambitious framework program. But now, how to, how to, how to measure progress in, uh, in knowledge and innovation, which is the topic of today's session. So um, economists like to, like to measure. And um, uh, the way how to measure knowledge is uh, a very complicated one. And so what, what is being assumed in, in economics that we can measure knowledge and inno uh, innovation activities um, uh, with a proxy, and this is the, the gross um, um, expenditure in research and development um, uh, um, activities. And um, uh, we usually, uh, or as in, in the most aggregate um, measure, we, we take the gross domestic expenditure on research and development activities. So this is basically the research and development um, activities performed by firms, by government labs, by universities or other actors within one territory. Um, uh, <coughs> and then, yeah, and then we can look at it in absolute terms or in, in, uh, as a percentage uh, to GDP. And um, uh, yeah, in 2002 it was already, um, like also within the Lisbon agenda, the idea was already to reach 3% of um, uh, European GDP um, in, um, yeah, as research and development expenditures. And as we see in the next graph, also in 2016, the EU 27 is not quite there yet. And um, I would like to also bring the discussion with, with you, Dr. Mogni, to, to that um, later. And especially if we compare um, the share of, yeah, of uh, GERD as a percentage of GDP with the OECD average with the United States or, for example, Japan, we see that the EU um, is still lagging, lagging um, behind in, in that respect. There are a lot of things we don't see in that graph too, which is, for example, the source of funds of, of GERD um, or also the, the, um, the sector of performance, but we don't have enough time to, uh, to go too much into detail. Um, uh, just maybe one important fact to mention here is um, that in absolute numbers, the United States is outperforming Europe um, by almost 100 billion US dollars in PPP. Um, and another tr very important trend was China that you also mentioned is, and indeed China has um, also outperformed Europe in absolute numbers in um, uh, yeah, GERD spending um, uh, in, yeah, in the last 10 years. Um, okay, uh, maybe one last point, maybe about 14% of what we see here of the GERD in the United States is uh, defense, so that, that maybe um, don't get me on that when you ask a question. <laughs> but um, yeah, so from this, we open the floor to discussions. I will just briefly introduce the questions we, um, we set, and then we, we're very happy to first get an answer from you, maybe um, yep. to our presentation, and then we can open the floor to everyone. And um, just some points we, we wondered, questions that we have where Europe is going. Um, First of all, if Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe um, can fill the, uh, the financing gap and spur the innovative capacity in Europe, 
in the future. Um, second, whether complementary interventions, um, such as uh, Jan mentioned, like inclusive innovations, smart speci specializations, education policies, um, can help to solve this, um, uh, the geographical disparity here um, in, in Europe. Um, uh, third, whether the EU is pursuing an only supply-led policy and through post keynesian lens, for example, are the arguments um, um, uh, stringent to pursue also demand-led policies. And last, um, uh, whether free access is key for innovation, but the actual intellectual property rights system does not go in this way. What can we do in this respect? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, first of all, uh, thank you so much uh, for your uh, comments and uh, thank you so much uh, for your questions, which are very pertinent and very, let's say, strategically important also from, uh, from a European perspective. So thank you so much uh, for, uh, for your active participation uh, and uh, your, uh, your questions. Now, um, on uh, financing, um, certainly there is a need uh, to support uh, SMEs. European SMEs are very weak. In Europe, we have uh, 27 million uh, enterprises, of which 26.2 are SMEs. Only 800,000 are MEs. And when I say SMEs, uh, the problem is not uh, in the M of SMEs, but the problem is mainly in the S of SMEs, meaning the small companies. The medium companies uh, have a capacity niches by niches, situation by situation, case by case, they have the capacity to do some research, they have the capacity to invest uh, in, uh, they have uh, a minimum of uh, family capital, they, have, uh, co they continue to have access uh, to bank capital, so they are uh, more resilient. The bigger crisis, the bigger, the worse situation, very dangerous situation is uh, the S of the SMEs, the small enterprises. The small enterprises, according to the European definition, is uh, between uh, one and, uh, I think, uh, 40, 50, 50 empl employee, uh, employees. Uh, they have been uh, cut off uh, from uh, banking uh, finance, from finance from the banks. Uh, they have difficulties uh, to prepare innovative business plans. They have a difficulty to implement uh, these uh, innovative business plans. They have difficulties uh, to create, a cons to belong to consortia or to create a kind of, uh, you know, aggregations which may reduce uh, the fixed cost or the, run or the, the variable costs, etc., etc. They, uh, they are very family oriented, so they are not listed in, uh, in the stock exchanges. Uh, these are the problems of uh, SMEs. Where the SMEs are located mainly? Italy, Spain, Germany, and France to some extent. So is a problem of, uh, is a business model which has been adopted by these countries uh, during the 70s, during the 80s, and during the 90s. Families uh, left the land, land was uh, sold, money was got, and with this money they start up a new shop, they start up a new artisanat, they start up in new, new activities. This was the model which led to a fast growth of the Italian economy, German economy, and uh, Spanish eco economy to some extent over the last uh, 30 years. Now, there is a, 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 a huge, I mean, an interesting rate of uh, creation of SMEs, but so natality is high, but also mortality is high, unless uh, these SMEs are supported by uh, governments uh, under different forms, subsidies, uh, tax uh, waves, waivers, um, contributions, uh, uh, incentives to uh, localize in certain particular <laughs> part of the country, or, think, or uh, support to become international. Only 30% of European SMEs are making business, cross-border businesses, only 30%. And only 15% of European SMEs are doing business with other non-European member states. So we are talking about a very provincial, very family-oriented, very locally-oriented SMEs. This is the problem. It's a business model 
that uh, uh, is not uh, sufficiently effective in this uh, globalized world. Very few SMEs are globalized. Don't forget that uh, one of the reasons why uh, small SMEs were, uh, I mean, developed so fast in the Silicon Valley over the last uh, 30 years is because uh, the American federal government uh, provided support to the SMEs and also because uh, the uh, antitrust, American antitrust, uh, uh, facilitated aggregation of SMEs. Because in Europe we have also this problem. If you have a, a too strong aggregation of SMEs, you may have immediately DG competition, antitrust bodies of European Union, which uh, start entering <coughs> into, 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 into the game, and uh, not necessarily in support of uh, too big aggregations of, of SMEs, which may lead to monopolistic positions or to oligopolistic positions, or anyway to something which may alter the free movement of men and capital and people and capital and, uh, and resources. So certainly SMEs, they, con they, they, continue, they continue to, have, to, have, to, have, to, to need the support. And uh, I fully agree with you that we needed to put emphasis on SMEs in Europe. This is a major problem. Then in Europe, don't forget, uh, we're talking about Europe, but Europe is not homogeneous. Eh? Western Europe is a something, Eastern Europe is something else. Eh? Uh, Poland, Hungary, uh, Croatia, I mean, uh, the Balkans, uh, pre-accession countries, uh, so, I mean, uh, the Baltics, etc. There are not so many SMEs, eh, by the way. So we still are uh, in, in a position that, uh, uh, I mean, Europe, uh, there is a kind of divide eh, between East and West. Eh? And also in uh, Western uh, countries, Western member states, uh, you have North and South uh, divide. Italy is a case in point. Spain is also a case in point. France is also a case in point. Eh? Now, incentives also need to be given to localization of SMEs. They need to be, to, uh, incentives need to be, to be given uh, to, 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 to finance the establishment of SMEs in areas where naturally they will not go. The problem is also to find out uh, export for SMEs uh, at a competitive level. So the problem is, uh, you know, to, to support uh, services for SMEs so consortia uh, and uh, clusters, this could be. And also there is an important uh, cross-fertilization. I mean, uh, some good examples in Finland may also be useful for uh, Italian SMEs. Uh, some good examples in, uh, in Germany may also be useful for French, French SMEs. So there is also this kind of circuit of information that is not uh, necessarily optimized. So we have this. Uh, um, um, now, support to the demand side, yes, uh, is important, but uh, this is done uh, through macroeconomic policies. <coughs> By keeping inflation under control, the euro has contributed dramatically to the eurozone. Uh, the countries in the eurozone have uh, witnessed uh, very important uh, uh, support to the demand side because prices have been stable, stabilized. So the purchasing power of people uh, increased in, in uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, something that, uh, that uh, has to be considered, eh? the economic stability induced by uh, the fiscal compact, by the six compact, by the two compact uh, to, to, to pack, and by uh, the growth and stability pact. So this kind of stability, which uh, somebody says austerity, others say not austerity. So this kind of stability has benefited uh, the purchasing power of consumers. Eh? Um, uh, inequality and concentration, yes, uh, this is the problem. Uh, people working for innovative SMEs, uh, international oriented SMEs, uh, SMEs which are attached to MEs, uh, SMEs which participate in a global uh, supply chain, etc., etc., they tend to be better remunerated. This is not only a reality in uh, Western Europe, in Europe, in European Union, but this is also a reality in China, in India in Brazil, in, uh, in Argentina, etc., etc., is uh, there is a risk of dualism. Uh, workers working for uh, nationally oriented or locally oriented SMEs uh, tend to be less remunerated. And also uh, the quality of skills is uh, may determine, uh, 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 let's say, inclusion or exclusion. Because uh, if you are uh, uh, a specialist in uh, data mining, if you are a specialist in cloud uh, management, in data management, etc., etc., your remuneration tends to be higher than a simple mechanic or a simple uh, carpenter who is uh, still working with traditional instruments. 
Also at the uh, industry level, in the factory level, you may find out uh, people doing hard work and people doing very dirty work, uh, not so much uh, productive at uh, the end of the day, it tends to be less remunerated then. But the remuneration uh, needs to be put uh, in, uh, uh, in, relation, in relationship with the productivity. Don't forget the main principle. I can, increase, I can increase your salary provided that you increase your productivity. If uh, your productivity is low, uh, I mean, uh, your salary tends to be lower. Uh, now, what, is, what are the determinants of productivity? Uh, cost of labor, uh, cost of, uh, of energy, inefficiency, administrative inefficiencies, uh, bad governance, a uh, bad organizational setup, etc., etc. So, uh, in, e in Europe, we have a fragmented situation and a number of uh, various cases where uh, people are low paid because productivity is low, even. Uh, uh, is um, uh, even in some cases is, ma is, is negative. So the relationship between uh, wages and salaries level and the productivity is, is fun fundamental. Um, by the way, productivity increases by introducing innovations, by introducing more modern technologies, by introducing a new way of uh, producing or a new way of organizing. There is a big problem of productivity, you know where? In the banking system in Europe. Banks, European banks, are lame ducks. In fact, their uh, margins, uh, in terms of productive, in terms of uh, um, uh, you know profit, and in terms of also a stock exchange value, their uh, the, 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 their margins are very, 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 very low, very modest. Uh, the quantitative easing implemented by the ECB has created a major problem on uh, the, uh, the productivity of, of the banks and profitability of the banks. So the zero interest policy has benefited you as a consumer, you as uh, as a uh, as a citizen, me as a citizen, but certainly did not benefit the balance sheet of the banks. Um, yeah, this uh, concentration risks, yes, uh, there is always a concentration risk. Uh, we have a DigiComp in uh, European Commission in Brussels looking at avoiding dominant positions. Uh, we are for the free market, we need to know what we want. Uh, either we want a competition, so we want a free market, uh, prices are results of demand and supply, competition, etc. Or do we want uh, concentrations which uh, may compete more on the international markets but uh, may distort uh, the national market? I mean, we need to know what, uh, what we want. Certainly, in my opinion, we need to achieve a kind of balance. And in fact, I must say that the DG competition, I don't know if you have seen the last cases, is quite, uh, in this respect, uh, relative to European SMEs or European companies, is quite uh, conciliatory. Uh, is she is not they are not conciliatory uh, towards the big, uh, you know, uh, big, uh, um, the GAFAs, the so-called GAFAs, Google, uh, Apple, uh, Facebook, uh, Amazon. Um, and American companies intervening in <coughs> Europe and uh, creating a dominant position in Europe. In fact, they have been fined one after the other. And then innovation and regional policies. Yeah, okay. Uh, innovation funds, innovation instruments uh, may facilitate the relocalization of SMEs. Now, where we have uh, good examples of this rel relocalization, um, uh, Ireland is a good case. Uh, Poland and Hungary are also good cases. Uh, Czech Republic, yes. Uh, I go quite often to Prague because I have some business with the local authorities and uh, I can testify that uh, uh, money given by local government uh, together with uh, instruments uh, provided by European Commission, the European Union, uh, has uh, facilitated the establishment of a number of SMEs, not uh, necessarily by the Czech uh, citizens, eh? maybe SMEs owned by Italians or by French by, uh, in, in, in the Czech Republic. So, but uh, certainly the regional policies, yes, the future regional policies, the future uh, FEDER, the regional fund, the social fund, the cohesion fund, these funds may facilitate innovation. But I think that in this respect, uh, there is a consensus at the European Parliament and also at the Commission level. How to measure knowledge and uh, uh, innovation? Yes, uh, you have spoken about uh, this ratio, uh, research and development expenditure on GDP. Uh, 3%, 2%, uh, we, are, we are not there, uh, it's clear, we are not there. But we are not there with a number of uh, indicators, I'm so sorry, uh, COP21 indicators, we are not there. Defense indicators, we are not there. ODA indicators, official development assistance indicators, we are not there. You remember the 0.7% of GDP, eh? this, was, this was an indicator fixed in the early 70s. So after 50 years, uh, we have not yet reached the 0.7% of external aid uh, relative to GDP 
in favor of the developing countries. So just uh, to tell you how difficult it is to reach indicators. And I don't speak about the Maastricht indicators. Eh? But this is another story. But when we needed to measure, measure progress, uh, I would uh, suggest also to consider other parameters. For instance, number of uh, uh, scientific publications uh, published uh, in prime uh, ma reviews, in prime, in prime uh, so at the university level, at the country level, at the regional level, whatever. So this is a good indicator. Another indicator is uh, uh, number of patents that uh, have approved, have been approved uh, by country, by region, by city, by sector. So this also patent is a very important indicator. Then you have a number of students enrolled in uh, STEM uh, faculties, mathematics, technology. This is another interesting indicator. And you discover that uh, in France, everybody wants to study Sciences Po. In Italy, everybody wanted to study uh, poli um, uh, law or political science. In Belgium, everybody wants to study communication, sociology, uh, you know, public diplomacy. You cannot make your, uh, your future career on this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of skills. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, <laughs> let's go, let's go, let's, let's see how many are interested in uh, uh, high computing, how many are interested in uh, physics, how many are interested in uh, mathematics applied to whatever, scientific uh, science, science and tech na natural sciences, uh, you know, space uh, s studies. So let's see the indicators in this respect. Let's see how much money each national uh, budget uh, provides to support uh, these kind of activities. European money is important, but let's see how much in the national budget is given to support uh, this. You know. Then uh, there is a people mobility. Uh, you are in France, but maybe that uh, the best technological center is Heidelberg, so you have to go to Heidelberg. So what is the mobility? And uh, here I'm talking also about Erasmus. But apart from Erasmus, you have <coughs> what is the capacity of a French lady or man to go to Germany or to go to England? Or to go languages is also very important. How many people speak languages? So this is, uh, these are the, uh, let's say, indicators which uh, gives me the impression that the country is opening up. How many foreign people are uh, enlisted, are enrolled in, uh, in a faculty? And what these people are doing? Uh, which faculty are they choosing? Then research. Uh, research is uh, with the university, but also with, uh, outside the university. How, many, uh, re how much research is uh, financed by big companies, by medium companies, and at which cost, and which, with, with uh, which kind of results? Uh, so these are indicators that uh, may be uh, quite interesting to examine. Maybe that there are others, but uh, certainly, uh, if you, somebody of you is interested, Try to, try to take a case, uh, which is a medical sector, uh, pharmaceuticals, production of medicines. Try to identify six or seven big uh, European companies in the field of um, pharmaceuticals. Pfizer, uh, I don't know, uh, there are many uh, here and there, Merckx, uh, Johnson & Johnson, etc. Send a, a, a questionnaire with uh, some questions. Ask uh, the, the manager to reply. Collect these uh, uh, this questions. And you will see, uh, try to identify good questions, of course, try to prepare a good questionnaire, and try, uh, try to see how these companies are uh, support and to what extent. Uh, so it's a good uh, proxy. Uh, you have at least, uh, you, you know, the big producer of aspirins, the big producer of, uh, of uh, antibiotics, the big producer of uh, uh, AIDS, uh, anti-AIDS uh, therapy, the big producer of, uh, I don't know, whatever. So try to identify how much these companies are investing in, uh, in uh, and then ask them uh, the, the, the patent, the, this famous protection that you were mentioning. Uh, what is the patent? And look at the European policies in order to facilitate uh, the uh, accession of uh, uh, generic producers, not necessarily in Europe, into the, the, the accession to the, to the generic market, to the generic uh, market uh, of uh, pharmaceuticals. So see what are the obstacles, see what are the opportunities, see where there is, there is resistance. And then uh, you, you, start, uh, you start having a kind of a good idea of uh, what is going on in one scientific sector and uh, uh, which kind of uh, protection is provided, which kind of uh, non-protection is provided, what are the requests of XYZ and how to manage all these uh, situations. These are uh, basically uh, the questions which are examined by DG competition whenever there is a case. So a suggestion that I give you, come to Brussels uh, and uh, let's, see, let's make some interviews to our uh, colleagues in DG Competition. 
in this case, uh, what is your uh, attitude? If uh, there is a concentration, I mean, what, is, uh, what could be the attitude of the European Commission? So you try to, 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 to understand the, the terms of the problem. These are more or less the, my replies, uh, replies to your questions. Yes. But we can also open yes, up the floor the and then... Uh, yeah, of course, yes, of course. Then we can discuss of course, of course. Maybe, uh, other yeah, questions. intellectual property. Yeah. yeah, of course, yes, I'm here. So. I take no. I take some notes here. No problem. Ah, you can see. Yeah, 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 don't worry. No, it's okay. No, no problem. I take them. Okay, please. If you have questions, I hope that uh, I have stimulated uh, stimulated you a bit. I mean, I think no. Uh, <laughs> don't look uh, passive or don't look uh, policy takers. <laughs> eh? you're, you're, you're citizens. You're, you're consumers. Eh? Yeah? You are. Uh, you are the future generation. Eh? The young leaders, I would say. Eh? Okay, please. Young leaders. So, come it was indeed quite stimulating. Thank you very much, Dr. Mordney. I'm Louis, uh, French from Option B. Um, I just want to. Option uh, B means? B means, uh, sorry, macroeconomics and finance. Okay. Um, sorry I, for my I just want, would like to raise two points that uh, puzzled me a bit uh, in your presentation. You, you talked on the one side of uh, you know, furthering industry 4.0 with automation and that kind of things. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, that's quite related to what uh, Jan mentioned. But and uh, relate, I mean, um, adding some kind of inclusiveness by uh, furthering job creation. We had the presentation on jobless growth, which was uh, basically, I mean, in face of automation, what do we do? And actually, the recent development are not really, you know, bright in the sense that. It's, it's led to quite a polarized labor market w by uh, favoring very low paid job in the service to person uh, sector. So I would like to know what you think of that. And then um, what you mentioned about the SMEs, the S in SMEs. I come from a small village in France and basically uh, my SEs are uh, my baker and my butcher. And you said that we should, you know, uh, elicit innovation in uh, in that kind of sh of um, of enterprises, include them in global value chains. Uh, how do you do that in very locally based <laughs> shops, which uh, are not that? Uh, I mean, I think the sector in which they uh, yeah. in which they act is not that. Uh, favorable for that. And actually I would like to refer to one of the results of the economy. So it's Bommel tragedy I mean, some sector. Uh, it's uh, the gains of productivity cannot be achieved simply because it, ta it takes as much time as uh, 50 years ago uh, to, uh, to have a haircut, basically. So how do you tackle that kind of things in that kind of situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, let me start with uh, the second question. Uh, there is a... Uh, can I collect two or three questions? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, no problem. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Hello, my name is Isabel Borja. I am uh, from Ecuador. And, uh, you are my from? Ecuador. Ecuador, yeah. And my uh, option is A, it's knowledge and innovation policies. Uh, I wanted to stress a little bit more the, the question of the, how this uh, knowledge framework would uh, have a very important repercussions on the national education systems uh, that our colleagues already mentioned in their presentation. And uh, I wanted to know uh, what were the main discussions and uh, complementary policies for the national that may be many very diverse uh, uh, national education systems in Europe, uh, and what policies uh, should Europe discuss to uh, analyze and uh, deal with the conflicts that came uh, into the national ed education systems uh, in this knowledge framework? Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Hello, uh, my yeah. name is Yannick. Uh, I'm from Option C, uh, which is development. You're from D? Uh, Option C, which is development economics. And I would like to ask a follow up question on the education topic as well. Uh, so, firstly, um, you mentioned that there are not enough uh, students and outcomes of the education system for certain technical uh, sectors. Uh, so, first, I would like to know if it uh, shouldn't be the other way around that the um, <coughs> that the labor market is adjusting to the outcome of the education system and that everybody should study freely uh, what he likes best. Um, 
And the second thing was, uh, okay, I just lost it, so I will pass the microphone. Uh, we'll come. <laughs> we'll come, no problem. Um, Sorry, I'm really sorry. So, <coughs> um, do you see, so you mentioned that, um, uh, I don't know your position on, but you mentioned that, um, of course, a lot of big companies are um, investing in research and development and might also invest in uh, education institutions. And do you see a risk that maybe uh, private enterprises uh, may influence the education system and might polarize also the education system uh, towards their needs and not towards the needs of the society. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, that's okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> No, okay, no, no problem. Uh, SMEs. Uh, how a small company may, uh, first of all, may be interested to uh, in, uh, to participate to the global, uh, to the global, uh, to international trade, to globalization. Secondly, is it capable to do so? And thirdly, um, if uh, this uh, SME or this S E is located in a small village, how can uh, can he, can he, can he, can, he be, can can it be able to uh, to participate to this uh, to this uh, mm, global uh, economic and uh, trade integration process? But uh, I don't have uh, I don't have a, a, a reply. You need to see on a case by case basis. I have an example. There is uh, an Italian company. I mean, it's a baker a bakery. It's a production of bread, and pasta, and bread which has been capable to uh, penetrate the American market, the Chinese market. They are selling uh, kilos of pastas uh, to American uh, enterprises, to American restaurants or Italian restaurants based in the, in, uh, in the US, uh, or the, the Chinese. Mm, you have uh, periodically, oh no, you have a periodically uh, container uh, moving pasta and bread and pasta. You have uh, small Chinese SMEs in the, in the same sector sending pasta to Europe for uh, making bread. Uh, all done is refrigerated, all done is, uh, is uh, fr frozen. You have containers arriving in Antwerpen, and the next day you have in the supermarket in, uh, in Brussels uh, bread made with uh, wheat uh, coming from China, or uh, manipulation of wheat coming from China. More or less good, this is up to you to taste. Eh? I, I don't know, but so this is a. Uh, Matter of fact, you have uh, small uh, producers of wine in France, in Bordeaux, big, or small, or medium, or whatever. They are selling wine uh, to, to the rest of the world. You have uh, small producers of wine in Bulgaria. I've seen uh, some of them uh, selling bottles to, 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 to Europe, to the, rest, uh, to the rest of Europe, including the German market, which is uh, a bit, I mean, as the give the impression to be a bit uh, sophisticated in terms of wine or whatever. So, so you have these uh, situations. Is uh, very much it depends on how you are organized in terms of logistics, how you are organized in terms of contact, how you are in organized in terms of banking facilitation, banking transactions. You needed to have letter of credit, you needed to have some bank account, you needed to have support by the bank. And uh, a lot uh, will depend also on the quality of the, of the product that you are offering. I mean, at the end of the day, you have a chocolate maker in Belgium, uh, not necessarily a big one. Um, Godiva or something like that. I mean, it's not a big one. I mean, selling chocolates around the world. I mean, you see these chocolates uh, in, in a number of. So it, it depends on the product. It depends. It depends on the marketing sometimes. So I'm talking about the macroeconomics. Eh? I'm talking about uh, uh, management of a, of a company. I'm not a CEO, but I mean, you need to have a CEO as, 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 uh, along these uh, these lines. I mean, it needs to. You need to be open to, uh, um, you know. One of, the, one of the major problems that uh, uh, European SMEs are confronted uh, today is uh, made up by the capacity, the enormous capacity of an incredible number of migrants to set up their own SMEs in Europe. You have an incredible number of migrants having a regular passport, having a regular authorization to, to stay in our countries, which have started an incredible number of SMEs in our country, very competitive much more competitive than the, the local SMEs managed by the local people. 
and exporting. In Italy, you have Chinese SMEs working in the field of textile, exporting textile to China. Hmm? I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, uh, a factory of 300 people or 500 people or whatever. I'm talking about a factory of three, four, five people who work in 24 hours a day, having a very huge productivity, and capable to export, a very good price, capable to export textile to China. So China is uh, exporting textile to us, and we are exporting manufactured goods or clothing or whatever to China. But this production is made by the Chinese living in Prato, living near Florence, which are controlling the, the, the all, all the, all the, all the mm, textile platform in Prato. And you have uh, more or less the same situations in other countries. So mm, we need to see how to, uh, you know. Uh, then you have the innovative SMEs. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that all the European SMEs are uh, out of market, are not competitive, are badly managed. No, 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 I'm not saying so. There are some SMEs in Europe who still occupy a niche of uh, productivity, a niche of innovation, a niche of uh, specif specific productions which are high in high demand. And of course, the remunerations tend to be different eh? because uh, you are uh, exporting, because uh, you are... Uh, uh, you know, uh, you, are, uh, you, are, you are productive and because uh, you are, uh, your, your qualifications are well uh, remunerated. I mean, this is the result. Don't forget that three quarters of the German export to China today is made up by German SMEs. Eh? Three quarters. Eh? I'm not talking about Group Thyssen. I'm talking about German SMEs in the village that you mentioned. In your case, you mentioned a French village, but in Germany is also other villages. So this is the major trend, uh, export trend, from Germany to China. So these German SMEs are capable to be competitive in the Chinese market despite higher cost of uh, um, higher remunerations in Germany, despite uh, all the problems that you may have in Germany, some problems there, and despite the fact that the euro is strong uh, relative to the dollar. <laughs> so despite all that, Germany is uh, managing today a, a surplus, a trade surplus with China worth 8% of the German GDP. This is the trade surplus of Germany to China. And the three quarters of this uh, surplus is generated by German SMEs exporting to China. So uh, this is a reality. Eh? So I'm not, uh, but uh, certainly um, SMEs need to be organized. And uh, the best organization that you can find out, to find out today he focuses on a close integration between man and machine, uh, efficiency gains, an added value, the selection of a good product, and also uh, access to finance at the good conditions, mm? not 5%, uh, not 7% on a loan, maybe 2%, uh, good conditions, uh, risk sharing, if you work in a consortium, you share the risk. If you work with the banks, you share the risk with the bank. So risk sharing is also important. Guarantees, somebody who guarantees. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, well, an identification of the market, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the target. Uh, the target is uh, people, consumer, market, uh, whatever. And logistics, uh, and also close connection between uh, manufacturing and services. A lot of uh, cost of production is indirect cost of production related to services, badly managed services, or inefficient services. Eh? Transport, is insurance, uh, whatever. Advertising, these are the services. Eh? This is for your SMEs. Um, educational system. Um, yeah, education is, is, is fundamental. Uh, uh, how can I say, uh, there is a, a, a direct connection, a direct uh, linkage, a direct uh, correlation between uh, um, uh, innovation and uh, education. This is certainly, certainly true. Uh, and I'm not the, one, uh, the only one to say so. If you read a new report made by OCDE, for instance, uh, on uh, uh, advanced education, on, uh, on uh, um, permanent education, on... Uh, um, uh, technical education, on, uh, um, um, yeah, on uh, retraining, training and retraining, retraining of those who have left their job due to the crisis, now they are in their 40s or their 50s, those guys need to be retrained, considerably retrained, 
and then, and then uh, utilizing the uh, modern, modern teaching technologies in order to accelerate also the, this process of re uh, reconversion. Uh, technology allows you to accelerate, not only to do something new, but uh, to accelerate the process. Uh, there is a, 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 a big problem in Europe, which is alphabetization. We are uh, receiving an incredible number of migrants who do not know neither to speak, nor to read, nor to, to, to make a letter, nor to make a CV. I mean, they are totally incapable to do so. They even they barely know a uh, language that we are speaking here in Europe. Uh, I'm not talking French or English because some people know. But I'm talking about German. There are migrants going to Sweden. They don't know Swedish. There are migrants uh, coming, going to Spain. They don't know Spanish. So we need also to alphabetize those people before uh, suggesting which kind of uh, new advanced training they need. Uh, we need uh, to, to make sure that uh, they know at least uh, to read and to speak and to, to at least to, to, to read something even technical or something like that. So, so there is a major uh, investment in the basic culture, in basic uh, knowledge that needs to be made at uh, this stage. And then after one or two generations, so I'm talking about 20, 30 years, you may have some consequences, some positive consequences on your economy. But for the time being, each of our member states needs to spend a lot of money in order to make sure that uh, those people, we are talking about 25 million migrants eh, in Europe, not only Italy, eh, to all the countries. Eh. We, we need to make sure that all these people are uh, capable to be inserted, to be included, eh, in a, not only in an economic cir circle as a consumer, but also in a technological circuit as uh, uh, people capable to, to manipulate instruments, eh, to manipulate uh, technologies. Eh. Uh, laser, uh, high-speed high computer, uh, biomedical equipment. I mean, uh, go to an hospital today and you will see which kind of innovative uh, technologies they're using. And you need uh, two or three years before being trained uh, in using these technologies. Very expensive technologies, by the way. Eh? Um, so uh, skills, yes, uh, the, the skills are, are important. Uh, and uh, But we need uh, to make sure that... Uh, uh, skills uh, acquired uh, in a university or in a technical school uh, are consistent with the skills demanded from, uh, from, from the entrepreneurs, demanded from the society. Because uh, today we are seeing that uh, there is this kind of uh, this connection between uh, what the university is producing and uh, the demands made by, by the industry or by the, the services. Um, go to a faculty of uh, economy and commerce in France, Italy or Germany and uh, look how many people are discussing fintech. Now, the new bank will be fintech. Technology applied to a bank, to a banking system, to bank, bank services. Okay, try to understand how many people in the university are capable to understand what a fintech is. They are making studies that they will bring them to work with a banking system in the, in the next uh, 30, 40 years. So this is the time horizon, no? 20, 30 years, let's say. Okay, in 30 years' time, the bank that you know, the bank that your father has known, the bank that I have known, will be totally different from the new bank. So it's really totally different. Today, you have a training of, uh, I mean, uh, universities, which is still teaching a banking, uh, on, the banking, on the banking affairs, on the banking matters, they still teach traditional teaching. Look at the books that they are using. And you will discover that uh, the books that they're using today are the same books that I used to be, uh, on which I used to, be stu I used to study uh, 40 years, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. More or less the same. So, I mean, uh, you see the disconnection. So when you go to, uh, to discuss uh, to your CV uh, at uh, the, the Human Resources Department of a bank and uh, they start asking you uh, something new, uh, you, you, you'll disappear. You, you become a bit uh, outside uh, what it's about. You, you, be, you, you become stressed. But I mean, this is the reality. Now, why on the skills? Why the German educational system is so good? Because they have a lot of technical, technical universities. The fam famous Technica Schule, Technische Schule, technical universities in Munich, in uh, Bremen. In, uh, there are no equivalent in other, in other uh, countries in, in Europe. Uh, but the German system works quite well. The uh, region of Bavaria has been capable to create 25,000 new, uh, 25, new jobs for uh, 25,000 migrants who came from Syria two years ago. All of them are working today in Germany, in all in Bavaria. 
just to tell you what is uh, the German capacity, not only to create opportunities, job opportunities, but also to educate uh, these people in such a way that they are almost immediately capable to, to contribute to the, to the well-being of this country as a consumer, as a taxpayer, as a producer, as whatever. So, I mean, uh, we need to see these models. Uh, we need to, to examine these models. Uh, investment in education si educational system. Yes, this is a, a task of uh, the national budget. Now, what is the fiscal space existing in Europe? I don't know where and uh, how much. Uh, all the European, most important European countries are overburdened by an incredible sovereign debt, uh, public debt. Uh, Europe is calling for uh, austerity. Uh, the first thing that you cut in a situation of austerity, you cut the expenditure on health, you, scat, you cut the expenditure in, in, in education. Uh, this is also what happens, by the way, in Africa or in Asia or in other countries under the IMF uh, stabilization programs or the World Bank stabilization programs. And you see the consequences. Africa is a cutoff from the international globalization process because an entire class <laughs> of uh, educate, relatively educated people disappeared over the, last, uh, over the last 10, 15 years. But certainly investment in education is a long-term investment, bringing long-term returns. So you need to, to make an investment today in order to have results next generation. Your, your, your son may benefit of your education because you're a mother and therefore you, so you, you see the in intergenerational connection source. Uh, the, the so-called social elevator uh, does not work any longer in Europe following the financial crisis. I mean, uh, a, a typical example, I, give, I bring you an example. 95% of the people going to University of Brussels, going today at the University of Brussels, are son or daughters of those who have been graduated in Brussels University. So you have a family where the father is, has a degree, w will be degree, University of Brussels a degree, the son has a degree, etc. Et you don't have a, a son of a farmer or a son of a carpenter going to University of Brussels. They don't go there. I mean, they, they do something else, but they don't go there. Just to make you an example, uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the 70s, at the beginning of the 70s, or during the 70s or the 80s, this uh, social elevator worked quite well. France, Italy, etc., etc. You have a lot of engineers uh, in France and Italy whose father or whose mother was uh, uh, cultivating the land, was a farmer, was a carpenter, a lot of these people. But today, <laughs> Also because uh, between you and me, the cost of university is very high. This is not a given as it was uh, at my time. To go, if you wanted to go to a British university, you have to, pay to spend 15,000 pounds. If you wanted to go to American university, you spend 70,000 pounds a year. So, I mean, it's not given. Eh? At my time, in, my previous in your previous generation, this was almost a given. So the taxpayer covered, the national taxpayer covered the full cost of university, of everybody going to university, almost free of charge. Okay. Um, yeah, ah, private enterprises. The role of uh, private enterprises in education. Yeah, uh, uh, if you are for the free market, uh, you have a public universities, a private universities, enterprise-oriented universities. You in the US, you have a Kellogg University, you have uh, in Europe, uh, you may have a Nestle University. I remember that Fiat wanted to create a kind of uh, high school uh, in Turin. I remember, so I mean, well, okay, Ford, maybe that they have an academy. Uh, another academy is Huawei. Uh, the other day I was in a meeting in, uh, in, Br in Brussels on Huawei Academy, Huawei Academy. So Huawei has an academy in Europe, but okay, fine. This is a, a free market. Uh, you open and then uh, you, you see if uh, people are interested to enroll and how much are they uh, available to pay. Uh, if you are not uh, for this uh, free market, uh, so you say uh -huh, just only public schools, okay, public schools, but this is a, a choice, a political choice. Uh, certainly, if uh, an enterprise uh, uh, manages also a university or a high school, uh, certainly uh, values of this enterprise uh, may be. Uh, but in Japan, uh, you have this kind of symbiosis uh, between um, Mitsubishi, Mitsui, etc., cetera, et cetera, Nissan and the local university. You may have also f companies uh, su supporting programs in the universities, eh? supporting cathedrae in the university, uh, providing money for uh, certain studies in universities. So this, is this kind of uh, 
symbiosis between university and enterprises has its positive and its negative uh, implications. Is it one there? Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm um, Tore. I'm from the often mentioned Germany. Uh, and in option C, which is development policies, um, yeah, like I don't think, like, mm, I won't say anything about Bavaria. Um, you started. <laughs> uh, it was just an example. Huh? Yeah, but I think it's a bad example for <laughs> well integrating migrants in Germany. Even if you have like, if you may have uh, one one good example, there are a lot of bad ones as well. Uh, you started your talk at some point where and painted like a p uh, and said mm, the main principles and values of innovations are, for example. Uh, that these innovation innovations need to be shared, that there has to be a free access uh, to innovations and that we need solidarity. But when you're talking about the economy, you oftentimes come back to competition. And I think we have a, a link there to like the different views we may have on demand side politics uh, when, you, uh, when you see this. Because I think if you look at inner Europe trading, it's I think 86% of uh, growth determinants uh, of the EU are in between the EU and we're only talking about comp uh, competitiveness and about competition while only 14% of the growth determinants are outside of like are outside EU trading and I don't think that austerity policies and like price stabilizing mechanisms had have led to a demand side push in the in the uh, last decades in Germany, uh, not in Germany, in Europe in general. Um, and I think like the way you started with innovations, we need to shift that to the economy as well and don't look at like competitiveness between uh, the, the countries, but at convergence between the countries. And especially if you would foster the demand side, SMEs would benefit because they are not trading and they benefit more from the multiplier factors of the demand side. Uh, and then I have a quick follow-up question. Um, we have... <laughs> All right. um, we have seen now in France and we have also see seen in North Rhine-Westphalia um, the most liberal parties that paint themselves as pro-Europe to implement um, tuition fees on non-European um, students and uh, I would like to have your um, y your view on it because you said that for knowledge and innovation it's very important you applauded the Erasmus Mundus pro program for example and that makes it so much harder okay um, no my question is um, first of all I'm Matthias I'm from Argentina uh, from the option B which is macroeconomic um, Policies, uh, well, etc. But I'll go straight <laughs> to the question. Uh, what is your option for you, please? Is macroeconomics, political economy, and finance? Ah, okay, okay. that was clear. Uh, but my question is not that much related to that, actually. No, um, okay. I wanted different. to ask I mean, in the old times, a big part of what you presented would have been trade policies, basically protecting the internal market and setting uh, trade barriers, quotas, tariffs, etc. Uh, in the current world, we cannot really do that anymore, and I don't know if we want it or not. Um, but you mentioned, for example, anti-dumping against China, um, and we know that sometimes that's used very often as a trade barrier, as an implicit one, the same for like technical barriers to trade. So I wanted to know if in the European Commission strategy there is any role for trade policy in order to develop, I don't know, we can, if we can call them infant industries or, or at least industries that are having problems to compete against uh, Chinese or Asian comp uh, yeah. competence. Any other question? No, uh, no that's okay. I will provide a, I will provide a relatively short, uh, I mean, uh, trying to, to be very concise, uh, very sy synthetic, I mean, uh, telegraphic. Um, solidarity uh, versus uh, competition. Um, 
yeah, a balance needs to be stri stricken between these uh, two dimensions. Certainly true. Um, I don't know how. I don't know in which way, but uh, certainly uh, when in, in, in which sector. For in, I, I, I made the example of uh, pharmaceuticals. When you have a generic available, and uh, uh, you know when you have also competitors within Europe or outside Europe competing with the same generics, I mean at a certain point the market should be open. This is the orientation of uh, the Commission. The market should be open to import a generic at a reasonable price in order to be distributed, to be sold to beneficiaries at a reasonable pr price. When you have a specialistic medicines, something which is a very special, tre very special treatment, which also obliged the very huge expenses in the field of research and development and testing, don't forget the expenses related to testing, which in many cases should last a number of years, mm, testing, number of years. So when you have this kind of situation, at a certain point you need to protect the producer, at least for a certain number of years, through a patent, a restrictive patent policy, in order to make sure that the producer re-enter or regain some of the expenses that he has made to develop the pharmaceutical product and to test it for a number of years. So on one side you have uh, the solidaristic principle which, uh, sh say which tells you let's distribute uh, this uh, pharmaceutical to everybody who is, uh, in, is in need at a reasonable price. It's not a matter of quantity but it's a matter of price. On the other hand uh, is uh, the industrial interest so the global economic interest, the interest of a state to uh, try to make sure that uh, the company who has made the investment, who has made the huge expenses in the field of development and huge expenses in the field of testing, may regain some uh, revenues, may obtain some revenues, which may compensate these huge expenses for a certain number of years. So it's just a matter of... Uh, this is an example on pharmaceuticals, uh, on other industries, consumer protection, some produ products which tend to, which aim at uh, protecting the consumer. Uh, it's the same story. Uh, on one side, the, the good should be diffused. On the other side, the government or Europe has to take care that the good, this good does not uh, uh, conflict with uh, the consumer protection uh, criteria. So. We need to see, it's a matter of balance between the two. I don't have a, a clear, more clear reply to you. Now, impact of austerity policies. Uh, okay, is, uh, once again, uh, is, uh, is, uh, we are talking about macroeconomics. We are talking about uh, how to manage uh, the sovereign debt, how to manage uh, uh, the use of the public deficit, uh, the public uh, budget uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a certain way. We are talking about how to keep inflation under control. Uh, so we are talking about macroeconomics. And uh, uh, Europe is there in order to ensure that uh, uh, the, the system, in this case uh, the Eurozone system, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is viable. Uh, we have also treaties uh, which have been signed by member states. Uh, I mentioned the fiscal compact, the growth and, and the stability pact. Uh, so these are international treaties signed by all the Eurozone member, member states. Uh. Uh, so it's not anything imposed uh, from Brussels, uh, it's not at all. Uh, you have the signature of ministers there. So if they've signed, they have to comply. I mean, this is a matter of fact. Uh, tuition fees, uh, yes, uh, tuition fees is a barrier. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, the Americans and the British universities are paying the price uh, of having increased uh, these uh, tuition fees. Uh. Um, my son paid 1,100 for one year in, in Cambridge. Uh for one year study in Cambridge. Now, you, to, you wanted to stay in Cambridge, you have to pay 10,000, uh, but it's okay. The Brits, uh, we see uh, if they have a lot of clients with uh, 10,000, uh, I don't know. Um, trade policy is, uh, and uh, trade barriers, yes, uh, Europe is uh, protecting itself. Uh, in, they will not say, they, they, they don't say that they are protecting. Uh, they are for open market, you see the G20 declaration, we are for fair, balanced, uh, open uh, trade uh, regime. So the phrases are there, uh, the, the rhetoric is there, uh, fantastic. And they repeat it uh, year after year. De facto, you have uh, producer associations in Europe asking for protection, steel industry, ceramics, uh, textile, so you have an incredible, uh, you have a procession of people going to the commission asking for protection. 
simply because uh, their companies are not capable to compete. There is a risk of uh, job, uh, job losses. There is a risk of uh, failure or bankruptcy of companies. So they are threatening Europe uh, with a number of uh, catastrophic, uh, potential catastrophic events if uh, Europe does not provide the kind of protection. So uh, uh, what Europe is doing? Because uh, at the end of the day, trade policies are under the European competence, uh, exclusive competence. Uh. So what Europe is doing? Well, OK, we strengthen the uh, sanitary and phytosanitary barriers. We are uh, imposing uh, technical, uh, technical specifications, technical control, technical standards. Um, we are uh, excluding uh, products, Chinese products or Indian products, having particular chemicals. Toys for children, the red, and also the, the chemicals. Everything referring to the chemicals. We have a chemical agency in Helsinki, very, very active in, do, in doing that. And then, uh, more recent, uh, and here I finish, uh, we have introduced uh, a new policy, which is uh, uh, investment screening. What does it mean? It means that uh, if uh, there is an investment coming from outside Europe, uh, and uh, this investment wants to go to high tech uh, industry, they want to go to to invest in uh, big infrastructures, whatever. So European member states, coordinated by European Commission, is making a security-related uh, screening. Meaning, we are examining if uh, this investment goes against the European security, European uh, strategic interests, European specificities, European whatever. And uh, this is a way for Europe to protect itself from these aggressive uh, attitude, investment attitudes, essentially shown by the Chinese, but in some cases also by the Russians, and in some cases also by the Gulf, the oil surplus uh, Gulf countries in the Gulf. Is it security? Sorry? Is it security? Security. Security. Oh. I mean, I, the investment, the, a, a non-European investment may create security problems oh, yeah, in Europe. So we are examining it in terms of security, in terms of specificity, in terms of uh, European interest, and in terms of European strategic, strategic interest, yes. So if uh, we decide that uh, this investment is, d is dangerous for one of these reasons, we close the, we say no, we close the, the, the then of course uh, we have the WTO instruments. Then of course uh, you have retaliations. Then of course uh, you have, uh, so you have a WTO panel, you have retaliations, you have uh, um, um, sanctions, you have a, a, a panoply of instruments, by the way, foreseen by the w WTO statutes. Eh? We are not uh, doing uh, something outside the international law, eh? not at all. Eh? So we are consistent with the WTO statutes. Okay. If you read the articles of WTO statutes, you will see that there is a chapter on subsidies, a, sub, a chapter on, uh, on uh, retaliation, on, uh, on, uh, on safeguards, etc., etc., etc. Okay, uh, we want.